Yeah, the time is now. I took this theme right from the book of Ephesians that we've been studying. But, but I want to ask you this. What is your outlook on life? There's three different kinds of people with three different kinds of outlooks. The first one is they see the glass of life as half empty. Half empty. They're called pessimists. Pessimists. They see everything, no matter what happens. They come to church and they say, how was church today? Well, it was half empty. Where were all those people? You see, they focus on what is not there. They're downers. They're downers, right? Then there's a person who is the optimistic person. They say, well, man, there was so-and-so, so-and-so. Hey, and you know what? They had a baby dedication service today, and they, they talk about all the wonderful positive things. They're optimistic about life. Optimistic about life. But there's a third kind of person. The third kind of person is the opportunistic kind of person who sees the glass, neither half full, not half empty, but they see the glass as an opportunity to quench their thirst. <laughs> they take it and they just drink that thing down. Yeah, they just, boy, that, oh, that was tasty. That was wonderful. They're, they're seizing the opportunity. And today I want to talk about that whole idea. To be opportunistic. Opportunistic. In verse 16 of this fourth chapter, fifth chapter, I should say, the fifth chapter of Ephesians, in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, verse 16 says this, making the most of every opportunity. You've got to make the most of it. Whether you're at home, on the job, at school, with friends, at church, no matter what goes on, you're going to seize that opportunity to do something for the glory of God. There's a verse found in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So when you're at work, you're doing it for the glory of God. If you're a student at school, you're studying for the glory of God. It doesn't matter what it is. At home, do it for the glory of God. Whatever it is, your, your intention is to make the most of every opportunity. Some people have put it this way. When life hands you a lemon, you make lemonade, right? You make something. You, you, this is an opportunity, an opportunity. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, he says, be very careful then how you live. I really like the King James Version here. It says, then, see then that you live or that you walk. The word walk is actually the, the Greek word here. But it means how you conduct your life. So most modern translations put it as live. How you walk. But walk is a step at a time. One, one step at a time. One step at a time. And, and so that's what you do in life. You take one step at a time. One step at a time. But the word circumspectly, I really like that word. You get the word like circumference out of it. You know, circumference all the way around. And, and spectacles. <laughs> spectacles. Looking. Last Sunday... Uh, after church, I made a hospital visit to St. Joe's. Uh, and after the hospital visit, power was out. I was making a turn at one of those Michigan lefts, but I was going to cut straight across on Lasser Road, go down towards my house. The lights were out, so I waited for the cars to go by, and they were stopped. I waved them, okay, it's my turn to go. And so I started across. I got past one car in the first lane, car in the second lane. There was no one in the third lane at that time. I cut across, and then that somebody decided... Oh, the way is clear all the way. They come zooming through. They T-boned my car, totaled my car out. I was being as circumspect as I could. I'm looking all around, but when I started to go down my own road, the place to my house, Lasser, I focused on the road, and I got hit by somebody that wasn't paying attention at all. I ache just a little bit today, but I have no injuries as far as I know. Some of you say, well, you've always been a little off. And so, but uh, I go to the doctor again tomorrow, and so anyway, circumspectly means you got your eyes open and you're paying attention. He says, if you're going to be opportunistic, you've got to live very carefully. You've got to be, have your eyes open, look around. God brings opportunities to you every single day. Every single day there's an opportunity to bring glory to God. But you know what? We're kind of sleeping at the wheel where we're texting, we're involved in something else, and we don't see what God is doing in our lives. We don't see it. Live carefully. 
He says, live wisely, not as the unwise, but as the wise. Do you know you can be very educated and learned and not be wise? There's a difference between being educated and smart and being wise. The wise person knows how and what to do with the knowledge that they have. They know what to do with the knowledge that they have. The unwise don't know what to do with what they know. I often say that my father was one of the wisest men I've ever met in my whole life. Although he just had a high school education, he wasn't a PhD or anything like that. He was a man who knew how to use the knowledge that he had. And when I'd get in a jam, I didn't matter what it was, even a pastoral issue, I'd call my dad, and my dad would always have, he'd just know what to say and how to get out of whatever situation it was or how to fix it. He was wise. He says, live wisely. If you're going to be opportunistic, you've got to live wisely. He says, making the most, you've got to live creatively. When life hands you that lemonade, lemon, you, get, you, you, you produce the lemonade. You make something out of that. You do that. You live creatively. No matter what life is handing you, you bring somehow, you bring it to the glory of God. He says, at every opportunity, because the days are evil. Anybody looked at the news lately? Are we living in terrible, depressing times? Oh, not economically. We're doing great economically. But is wickedness rampant in our culture? It's everywhere. Everywhere. We live in evil. So he says, listen, if you're going to be opportunistic for the glory of God, you've got to realize the times in which we live are evil, and you've got to choose to live for the glory of God and seize every opportunity to live for him. So be opportunistic. Be opportunistic. And, he says, be understanding. He wants you to be wise. Listen to what he says. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, what the Lord's will is. You've got to understand that. I find it very interesting. Found in the book of Chronicles, David is chronicling um, his army. And he's talking, he's bragging about all of his soldiers and what they're able to do, their mighty feats. And there's just a whole long list. Most people kind of just fly right through it because it's just a bunch of names that you can't hardly pronounce. And then you get to this one verse. In verse 32, I love this verse. The men of Issachar who understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. That was my dad. I was just bragging about him. My dad seemed to know what to do no matter what the circumstances were. I, I get in a jam sometimes and I call some pastors and the pastors say, hey, this is my situation. I explain it to them. They say, boy, I don't know what to do. But whatever you do, when you do it, and you find out how it works out, let me know. <laughs> Thanks a lot, buddy. You, you know, here I'm just a young, upstarting preacher. I don't know what to do. I'm asking you. You don't know what to do. And you say, when you figure it out, let me know. I call my dad. My dad have an answer. He said, my dad would say, well, I don't know what you'll do, but if it were me, this is what I would do. And then he'd just tell me, what do you do? And he'd just lay it out there. Finally, in my one situation, I had a pastor who finally said, listen, don't put my name on this, but this is what you need to do. You see, you need those men. David and his army, he had the warriors. You know, they could bite, fight battles. He had the archers. They should shoot arrows. He had all these different kinds, and he brags about them in that chapter. He's bragging about his army. But he comes to the men of Issachar, and he said they knew the times. They had a pulse on the culture, the situation, and they were strategists. They knew how to put together a strategy of victory. Man, does the church of Jesus Christ need that today? People who can assess the times and give you what you need to do to live for the glory of God. Men like Issachar. Issachar. If you're going to be understanding of God's will, you're going to have to be a person of the book. In the age in which we live, God has revealed his will for our lives in the Bible. In the Bible. And if I'm going to know what the, the, the Lord's will is, I'm going to have to be in the Word and allow the Word to, to permeate me and be in me. 
I mean, I don't always have my Bible with me. Right at the moment, I, I do. It's right here. Here's my Bible. But there are times I don't have my Bible with me. And what do I do? Here's a situation right there. I remember the verse that I have read or the verse I have committed to memory. I memorize that verse. I know that verse. I'm able to recall that verse. Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. Whoa, I shouldn't be in this situation. I shouldn't be with this group because that's not the man God blesses. And, and so I, I, I bring to recall verses. You see, if I'm going to know and understand God's will, I'm going to have to know his word. If I'm going to be the fool, you see, the Bible talks about a fool. A fool is a person who has no spiritual sense. That's a fool. Has no spiritual sense whatsoever. Therefore, do not be foolish. Get some spiritual sense so that you can understand the word. You want the word in your life and you can understand what God is doing. You'll be understanding and not foolish. So this passage says, be opportunistic and be understanding. Be understanding. You've got to know what's going on. And be spiritual. Be spiritual. Now, we've talked about being spiritual the last couple of weeks. Since we've been in chapter 4, there's been this theme that uh, if you're going to be spiritual, you must learn how to stop certain things in your life. And it's not enough to stop. You've got to start doing certain things in your life. The spiritual person is not lukewarm. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the church of Laodicea. They're lukewarm. They're neither hot for the Lord nor cold. They're just lukewarm. They're on the border. They're half and half. And so they're not hot or cold. And you know what Jesus said? I spit them out of my mouth. I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you're a lukewarm, a lukewarm Christian, you're neither hot nor cold. You're just you're half and half. I spit you out of my mouth. Listen, he says, if you're going to be spiritual, you got to stop. What, what do you got to stop? Well, let's put it this way in chapter 4. He said, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. You used to live a certain way when you were without Christ. You put that life off. Your old self, which is corrupted and it's deceitful. And you put on a new self, which you've been made in Christ. Your new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That was unrighteous, unholy. This is righteous and holy. And the way you do this is you've got to change your mind, your attitude, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. With this in mind, he jumps into the text and he says, if you want to be spiritual, you have to be sober. You have to be sober. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Do not get drunk on wine. State of Michigan helps us with this. Very rarely do I go to the state to help me. <laughs> with anything spiritual, that is. Michigan, the legal standard for drunkenness is having <laughs> .10 alcohol in the blood, while .08 is considered impaired. So, another way of putting it is like this. Even Michigan considers it wrong or a sin to consume more than three drinks in an hour if you are under 150 pounds or just one strong drink if you're under 150 pounds. You can look it up online. It's real easy. The Bible says do not get drunk on wine. Why? Because wine, when you get drunk, leads to debauchery. You know what debauchery is? It's indulging all your senses, sensual pleasures. You get real loose and you begin to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And you mean, some people say you start to act stupid. All right? In fact, how does the intoxication affect you? It affects you in many ways. Your physical life is affected by intoxication. It gives all kinds of liver diseases and that kind of stuff. It just affects you physically. You lose control of, of your senses and your well-being. Uh, uh, you, you drop your precautionary guard. Uh, you're not as attentive. Your reaction time is not that good at the wheel behind a car. You, you got the picture. Hey, it affects your work life. If, you, if you're intoxicated on the job, you are not performing as you ought to. It affects your work life. Listen, it affects your emotional life. You're either a happy drunk or you're a mean drunk. There's usually never in between, one or the other, okay? And it affects your emotional life. 
okay? It goes on and affects your married life. You go home, you have no relationship with your spouse because you're controlled by this influencing factor in your life, and you're not the husband or wife that you should be. It also affects your family life. How can you parent if you're not in full control of yourself? It affects your social life. Pretty soon, you don't want to be around other people. All you want to do is be around the bottle. You want to, you see, see what I'm saying? It affects, what it's doing, it's affecting every area of your life. It affects your rational life. Your thinking process is impaired. You don't think right. That's why some people say he's acting stupid. It affects your spiritual life. This is, this is a death blow. This death blow. It affects your spiritual life. You're back over here. When the Bible's saying you should be over here, the point of all of this is when you surrender to alcohol, it takes control of every compartment of your life. It affects everything. It affects everything. It does. So he says, be sober. Stop. Do not Get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, just fulfilling all your other sensual gratifications. He says it leads you to big trouble. Instead, he says, be filled. This is the opposite. Instead of being drunk with wine, he says, instead, be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Actually, the text says, keep on being filled. That's what the Greek tense says. Keep on being. You don't fill yourself. You allow yourself to be filled by the Holy Spirit. So just like you allow this drink to take hold of you and control every part of your life, you allow the Holy Spirit to take control of every part of your life. To be filled doesn't mean i got to get more of the Holy Spirit. You're driving down the road and you see a, a motel. You're looking for a motel and it has a vacancy sign, right? And when you see that vacancy sign, that tells you that there's still room, right? And so you go there and just as you pull in, boop, the light goes on. <laughs> no vacancy. What does that mean? Well, that means it's full, right? It's full. Now, wait a minute. You're telling me you couldn't squeeze another person in one of those rooms? Well, of course you could squeeze a person in one of those rooms. You could probably squeeze another person in every single one of those rooms. It's not the point. The point is every room has an occupant. And that's the concept here. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every aspect of your life, every compartment that was influenced and impacted by the wine is now to be influenced and impacted by God the Holy Spirit. So being full of the Holy Spirit. You see, the day you got saved, you got all the Holy Spirit you'll ever get. You don't get any more or less. He doesn't come in quantities, a lot or a little. But he does, when you allow him, control more and more and more rooms in your life. Now, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Him. If you have the Holy Spirit, you belong to Him. That's the way it works. you got all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. What you need to do is allow the Holy Spirit's intoxica uh, intoxication to infect your physical life, that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is sacred, and I'm going to treat it as a sacred thing. I'm not going to let something else influence me so strongly that God the Holy Spirit is not influencing me. It affects, my, it affects my work life. The Bible says, do unto my employer or my, my master. We should be a people, if there's any people who sing, when you come to church, you should in the pew be singing. That's all part of worship. It's how we get filled with the Spirit. Singing and praising God, that, that brings me over into this camp, takes me away from that camp. I should be singing and singing as unto the Lord. Listen to what he says. Sing with psalms, that's, a, that's the Psalter, the, the Bible. And certain songs that we sing are right directly the words right from the book of Psalms. Others are hymns, and they're not out of the book of Psalms, but they're kind of sacred old songs that we have sung for quite a while. They had them back in the early church. They had these hymns. 
songs. They're singing. They're speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. And then he says, and spiritual songs. I consider that to be praise music. Praise music. You do realize back then they didn't have the piano and they didn't have the organ. And back then what they had was the harp, the lyre, which kind of guitar instrument. Oh, we do that every once in a while. We have guitar up here, yeah. Spiritual songs, songs that are neither psalms from the book of Psalms nor hymns out of the hymnal, but they're spiritual songs that minister to my heart in a contemporary way. He goes on and he says, speak. Now, some of you don't like this one, rap music. He's not talking here about singing these songs. Did you notice that? He says, speaking to one another. So I can sometimes just quote one of the hymns. Just quote it. You know, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for thee. Oh, let's, I just quote in the song. I, I could do the same with, a, with a, one of the psalms, like I did Psalm 1 earlier, and spiritual songs. Listen, then he says, rap music is, is, I don't know, I don't consider that like singing. It's kind of like just speaking to a beat and a rhythm and all of that. And that's exactly what the text, do you know there are Christian rap artists? Oh, there are, there are. And some of their songs are, or their speaking's pretty good. I like it. Some of it, eh, not so good. I don't like it. That's a matter of taste. That's really not a matter of right and wrong, it's a matter of taste. Did you know that there's nothing immoral about any music? All music is is a bunch of sounds put together. Now, when I string them in words, I can make bad words, which the Bible tells me not to curse and a lot of other things. But music in itself, there's no, there's no evil music. There is none. After telling us to speak, he now says, sing, sing. He says, sing and make music in your heart. I call that humming. <laughs> I, every now and then I'll hum something. I'll be humming along. Hum, hum. And especially if I don't, you know, I'm singing a song. You know how that works? You're singing the song and all of a sudden you have a lapse of memory what the words are, but you know how the tune goes and you just go, hum, 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 hum. And then you pick up where you remember the words again and you start singing. You, am I the only one that does that? No, I see heads say, no, you do that too. All right, humming, look at what it says, to the Lord. This is the key. This is the key. The person sitting next to you is not your audience, folks. Mm -mm. I try to convince our praise team every week, I want you to worship in such a way, you go into the presence of God and just bring us along with you. Because it's not your singing for us out here in the audience. You should be singing to the Lord. It just so happens when we see it, we say, hey, where you're going, I want to go too. I want to go to the presence of God in my song. I want to be more spiritual. I want to be more spiritual. He says, do this to the Lord, to the Lord. Be passionate, be emotional in your singing unto the Lord. Also, another way in which you can be spiritual is just to be thankful. Be thankful. Always giving thanks to God the Father. Always thanking God the Father. Notice what he says. For everything. Whew, that's the hardest part. There I was, sitting, totally stunned in my car. It just got nailed. Boom. It shoved me over across into another lane. I hit another car that was sitting there waiting for the, at, at the light, which was no light there ever before. We stopped. I hit the front of him. Boom. And, and so I'm jarred both ways. And... And everything? And everything? Well, I guess I could be thankful. I guess I'm going to get a new car out of this. It was totaled. <laughs> you, see, you can be thankful in everything. Peter, when he was being persecuted, thrown in jail, said, I thank God, he's thankful, that he counted me worthy to suffer shame for his name. You know what we'd all be doing? Boy, we better have a prayer meeting get Get Peter out of there. Man, this is terrible. What's happening to Peter? And Peter is saying, thank you, God, that out of all the...